Glad you're here this morning. Welcome home. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day today. Well, I'm going to uh, share with you for just a moment what God has put on my heart. Uh, but before I do, as always, I want to uh, give honor to our pastors, Brother Billy and Sister Peggy. Thank you so much. They don't ever ask for it. They don't ever expect it. But I want to honor them because they are honorable and we want to thank you for all that you do for the kingdom of God. And I want to thank you for all that you do for myself and for my family. Y'all are wonderful examples of Christ. So we want to thank you and honor you this morning. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2 this morning. Colossians chapter 2. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, you can open there with us. Um, also, you can find us on the YouVersion Bible app if you've got that on your phone. Uh, you can go to the YouVersion app and click on more and then events and it'll pull up Calvary Tabernacle. You can click on Calvary Tabernacle and we've got some sermon notes. We've got some announcements in there. We've got some ways that you can connect uh, with us here at the church throughout the week on there as well. So if you haven't done that in a while, check that out again. Or if you've never done it before, uh, then you can uh, do that. It's a great way to, to get connected with everything that's happening here at Calvary Tabernacle. All right. Well, my, the title of my message this morning is Rooted in Christ Jesus. Rooted in Christ Jesus. I'm just going to let you know right off the bat, this entire message this morning is all about Jesus. Jesus, the name above all names, the only one worthy of praise Jesus, King Jesus. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, several weeks ago, I preached through Colossians chapter 1. So this is kind of a, a part 2 of what's going on here. Um, and just as a quick recap, in case you missed it, uh, the Colossians is a letter from Paul to a church in Colossae. This is a church that Paul didn't start. Uh, it's a church that, as far as we know, he never even visited before, uh, but he had a good friend uh, that did start it and came back and told Paul what was happening there in Colossae. And so Paul thought it was necessary to write them a letter. And so in chapter 1, we read that Paul lays the foundation for the instructions that he's about to give the church in the following uh, chapters 2, 3, and 4. And this foundation that he lays is this. Christ is supreme. Christ is supreme. He's telling the church, he's, gonna, he's about to give them instructions, but before I tell you how you should act, before I tell you what you should do, you need to know this, church in Colossae, Christ is supreme. Christ is the living God. God incarnate. God in the flesh. Jesus is not just some prophet. He's not just some spokesperson for God. Jesus is God, and he came and he lived in flesh like you and me. I don't know about y'all, but I, I've, I've heard it said this way. Uh, if you're dating someone or interested in dating someone, you know, you've got a crush on someone. Oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, I... I, I I want to talk to her. Like, you know, I want to ask her out. Or if you, you're in a relationship and you want to, I guess more specifically, if you're in a relationship and you, you want to marry this person, you want to ask her for her hand in marriage, is it a good idea to ask your best friend to go ask your date if they will marry you? No, not a good idea. Don't do that. It's not suggested at all. What do you do? You go in person. You don't text them, hey, will you marry me? You don't call them up on the phone, hey, I, I, I've really enjoyed spending time with you. Will you marry me? Like, no, 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 no. You go in person. You ask in person. Why? Because when it comes to matters of love, these things have to be expressed in person. And I love that our God did not just send a representative, 
We know he, he had the prophets that were giving his words leading up to the big event. But what was the big event? God himself came to us and showed his love. He didn't just say a word from somewhere up in the clouds, but he came in the flesh and demonstrated his love. Someone say, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so Paul is writing to this church in Colossae, and he's like, you have to understand this. It's all about Jesus. Everything that we believe as the church centers around this one man. It's all about Jesus. Jesus. And so Paul, he's about to address several, and and started in chapter one, but he's about to continue to address a couple of things that were trying to take place within the church in Colossae. He's warning the, the members there in the church. He's saying this, listen, you need to understand that there are some really bad ideas that are trying to sneak their way into the back door of the church. You need to be aware of it, You need to know how to confront it, and you need to know how to overcome it. And he's more specifically, he's telling them about these two religious ideas that are trying to just kind of creep in real slowly. And these two ideas were, the first one is the idea of Gnosticism. And this this idea brought that God is too holy to be connected with or concerned with the affairs of humanity. He's too holy and too righteous and so far disconnected that he's not concerned with what you're doing. He can't be bothered by your problems. He's too holy. This is one idea, Gnosticism, that was trying to move its way into the church. And the other idea that Paul confronts is the idea of Jewish legalism, which is this idea that you have to perform a certain way. Or you have to perform certain rituals to get God's attention because he is so far away. You've got to do certain duties to get his attention. And then maybe he will share some of heaven's secret wisdom with you. And this idea was that there were certain people in the church who were just connected with God enough that God was giving them certain wisdom, but that he wasn't available to the whole church. These are the ideas that were trying to sneak their way into the back door in the church in Colossae. And Paul says this, you need to understand Christ. You need to have an understanding of who Jesus is and what he did, because what he did opened the door for the entire church to have access to a holy and righteous God. Hmm. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't mean to get on your toes this morning, but I don't think that that was a good enough reaction to what was just said. Jesus came to open the door so that we wouldn't have to be alone forever without God. Come on, church. That is the best news you will ever hear. The best news you will ever hear. And so Paul is, is confronting these religious ideas, and he thought it was necessary to write this to the church. And so we're going to read the next part of his uh, letter that he wrote, uh, Colossians chapter 2. If you would read it with me, we'll also put it up on the screen for you. Paul says this, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea. And for many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence. Some will say complete confidence. Look at the person next to you and say complete confidence. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. Someone say Christ. As As we keep reading through this chapter here, 
Every time we come to the word Christ, would y'all just say it out loud with me? Is that good? Is that good? Because I want you to notice something right here. Watch what Paul is doing. Verse 6. And now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. The word of God is good. It's good. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete. Someone say complete. Through your union with who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with, when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised from the dead. Are y'all getting the picture Paul's painting here? I think you are. I think you are. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Mm. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud and they are not connected to the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. Ooh. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that as we read it and study it and dig down into it, God, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, that your words would go beyond just something we hear with our ears and beyond just something we juggle around in our mind. But God, I pray that your words would sink down deep inside of us and cause us to be different, to cause us to be changed, to cause us to, to look and act a different way. In Jesus' name, someone say amen. 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 Come on. Here's point number one. If you're taking notes, I would invite you to write this down. You can be confident in Christ. You can be confident in Christ. Throughout Paul's letters that he wrote to different individuals and, and several different churches, he speaks a lot about being confident, more specifically being confident in who Christ is. In verse 2 that we just read, he says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. Christ himself. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. That's what we've had up on the screen. But the version you may be reading may say full assurance. You need to have full assurance in who Christ is. You have to know. You've 
got to get it. You can't let this one pass. You, you can't just go through this Christian walk and, and just pretend like you're doing the right things and saying the right words. No, no, no. You have to have a complete understanding, a complete knowledge in who Christ Jesus is. You've got to know this. And I love that Paul tells us we can be confident in Christ. You can be confident in Christ. Paul, he d- directly confronts these religious ideas that there is some high spiritual wisdom that God is withholding from us because we are not holy enough to, to be given this spiritual wisdom or understanding. And Paul says this, listen, if you're looking for some of heaven's secrets, I can tell you all about them. It's, it, and there's a man, in fact, that came to reveal all of heaven's secrets to you. And he was a man named Jesus. He calls him Christ, which means anointed. He is the anointed. He wasn't just a man. He is God in the flesh. Mm, Come on. He says this. This is basically what Paul's saying. If God had a secret, Jesus came and spoiled it. If he had a secret, there was somebody that came and spoiled it. Have you ever... uh, got excited about watching a movie and uh you know you maybe you didn't get to go the opening weekend that it was released or anything like that and so but you talk to one of your friends that had and they they want to tell you about it so bad and you're like no 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 don't spoil it for me i want to go see it for myself right here's the thing if you go to the movies everything in the movie is going to be spoiled obviously right cuz you're seeing the movie that's what paul is saying here if you see jesus This mysterious hidden wisdom that you keep talking about is going to be spoiled. You're going to receive it. You're going to see it. You're going to know it. Because Jesus didn't come to conceal God. He didn't come to to kind of hide God and say, oh, he's too holy for you. God sent me to tell you that he's he's too good. He's too righteous. He's too holy. You're not good enough. You got to do better. No, no, no. What did Jesus do? He came to reveal the heart of God. Yeah, you're a sinner. Yeah, you're messed up. Yeah, you're, you're stupid sometimes. But he loves you anyway. And he sent me to show you just how much he loves you. And Paul is saying, this is the guy that you can put your confidence in. This is the guy that you can build your life on, set some roots down into and, and build your life on this man, Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And he says this, you can have complete confidence that you understand God's mysterious plan because God already came and revealed this mysterious plan. He revealed it in the person of Jesus. In verse 4, Paul says, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you all about Jesus. He's gone through the whole first chapter that we read here. And and now in Chapter 2, verse 4, he says, I'm telling you all of this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. How many of y'all live on the other side of Atlanta? If you're going down 59, you live on the other side. Just, just raise your hand. Come on. Y'all, y'all don't be shy. No one. Okay. We got one person lives on the other side of Atlanta. All of y'all came from, right? All right. Good job. How many of you know as you drive down this highway, you can count 10, 15, 20 different churches between here and the other side of Atlanta? And as you're driving through, you you see all the the different names, all the different buildings and all the different denominations and, and styles of Christianity. And Paul is, is saying this, that there's a difference between just being a church and understanding who Jesus is. Like you can be a church that is deceived. You can be a church that you're confident in what you believe, but it's not the truth. And he's saying this, I'm telling you all about Jesus so that no one will be able to come in and deceive you. Because if you are confident in who Christ is, then you won't be swayed or you won't be convinced to put your confidence somewhere else. And I think what Paul is doing right here in verse 4 is he's 
I, I, I believe he's kind of throwing the picture back to the beginning of Genesis where Adam and Eve are in the garden and, and there's Satan and he comes to them and, and he says, did God really say that you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? And Eve said, well, no, that's not at all what he said. He said we couldn't eat or even touch from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. If we do, we will die. What did Satan say? You won't die. What? Why would he tell you that? God, God, why'd you tell him that? You're not going to die? Are you? That's what he said? No, no, no. He just knows that if you ate from this tree, then you would become like him, knowing both good and evil. That's why he doesn't want you to eat from the tree. So Eve is looking at this tree, and Adam's right next to her, and they see the fruit, and it looks good. And Adam and Eve thought, man, I could really use some extra knowledge, some, some secret hidden wisdom. You see what Paul's doing here? It says in Genesis that Eve was, someone help me out, Eve was convinced. She was convinced that the fruit that was right in front of her was good for her. So she took it, she ate it, and she gave some to her husband Adam who was right there with her. I think that says something else about men altogether because if you remember from this story, God didn't tell Eve not to eat from the tree. He told Adam. So Adam had to have told Eve what God said. Eve was deceived. Adam was just rebellious. Eve was convinced that the tree was good for her. Adam was just like, I think I'd love to be as smart as God too. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> but Eve was convinced. This is what Paul is saying in verse 4. He says, I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. Do you all know what deception is? If someone is deceived, they don't know that they've been deceived. That's the whole idea of this word. If you've been deceived, you don't know it. What is deception then? It's misplaced confidence. Misplaced confidence. Someone else came in and told you a story that, that just tickled your ears, and so you put your confidence in that person or that word or that idea instead of in the truth. And so this is what Paul is saying. You've got to know Jesus Christ because if you don't, you're going to misplace that confidence. You're going to fall for anything else. And this is what he's telling them. I've come here to tell you about Jesus so that you don't do that, so that you're not deceived, so that you're not tricked, so that you're not swayed by any other high-sounding nonsense. It sounds good, but it's not actually the truth. Colossians 1 verse 25, Paul tells the church, I think this is interesting. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. What was that message that he just got done telling them about? Jesus. That's it. That's the entire message. If you read in your Bible, you'll notice you got to go through a lot of Scripture before you ever hear about Jesus. And if you don't realize it, then you probably don't know that all the Scripture that you just read is telling you about Jesus. All of the Old Testament is about one man, Jesus. The New Testament tells us when he comes on the scene, but the whole Old Testament is leading up to this one person, Jesus. He's telling you this. I, you got to know who Jesus is because he's the entire message. And the reason why we have so many denominations and so many ideas in, in Christian culture is because we've got so many ideas of who Jesus is. Mm. You've got a lot of the Jews that still, they, they believe the Old Testament and they're still holding on to it and they're still waiting on that Messiah to come. Why? Because they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah that came. And so they're still holding on to hope 
from all of the Old Testament and all the the prophets and all of the law, still hoping that one day this Messiah is going to come. He did. He already has. He was already here. But their ideas about Jesus was different. Paul is telling you this, hey, if there was ever any Jew, I was that guy. If there was ever any guy that was, that was proficient and knowledgeable in the old scriptures, I was that guy. But now I'm here to tell you that all of that was fulfilled in one person, Jesus. This is the entire message. And so he's telling us this right here. You can put your complete confidence in Jesus. Don't raise your hand right here. That's your fair warning. If you do, then you're about to get put on blast. But how many, just remember, don't raise your hand. Rhetorical question. How many of you have your complete trust in Jesus? Complete confidence in Jesus. Because I think here in, in America, we've, we've got this idea that, oh, I trust Jesus for my salvation. Well, you kind of have to, right? What are you going to do about it? (laughs) I think sometimes it's easier for, for us to have confidence in Christ for our eternal salvation. I think it's sometimes easier to have confidence in him for that than it is for our marriages or for our retirement accounts or for our children who just aren't acting right. They're just a little bit stubborn. You just kind of want to pop them in the back of the head, right? Sometimes it's easier to trust Jesus and have complete confidence in him for your eternal salvation. But it's harder to have confidence in him for your career decisions, for your investments, for your relationships. This is what Paul is saying. You can have complete confidence in Christ from start to finish. This is a man that you can put 100% into. If you're taking notes, would you write this down for me? Please write this down. It is impossible to be overconfident in Jesus. I'm going to say it again. It is impossible to be overconfident in Jesus. You might can be underconfident in him, but you can never be overconfident in Jesus. He is reliable 100% of the time with 100% of your life. I love this. This is a, uh, a quote from Martin Luther. He says this, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and so certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. Ooh, that's good. Like you can, put, you can put so much confidence in Christ that he's not going to let you down, that he's not going to turn his back, that he's not going to fail you or forget about you or leave you behind. You can, if you had a thousand lifetimes to live, you could put, you could build every single one of them on this man, Jesus, and never regret it. Ooh, come on, church. Someone say, I can have confidence. I can have confidence. Colossians 2, verse 6, Paul says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. You accepted him at the beginning when you heard about him, but don't let that be it. Continue to follow him. Where are you going, Jesus? I'm going to go there too. What are we doing this week, Jesus? I'm going to do that too. I think we've got this kind of messed up idea in our Christian culture that, you know, we've, we've, we've been told, well, invite Jesus into your life. And you, you need to invite Jesus into your life. Whenever I read the word of God, though, it gives us a completely different idea. It gives us the idea that we can build our lives on Jesus What would that mean for us? This this is a real practical way you can think about this. In the morning when you get up, one of the first things you probably think about is, what do I have to do today? 
What do I got to accomplish? What do I got to do? What's, what's the goal? Like, what's, what is on the agenda for today? Jesus tells us this. He says, seek first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what would that look like in our lives? That would look like us waking up off the pillow and saying, God, what's on your agenda today? God, what would you have me do today? I've got so many things going on. I've got so much to do. But before I do any of that, what do you want today? What's on your heart today? What's your desire today? Holy Spirit, give me your wisdom so that I can serve your kingdom today. That's confidence in Christ. Because what's the promise that after you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what's the promise? All of these things will be added to you. Everything else will be taken care of. We just have to put our confidence in Christ. Here's point number two. You can be complete in Christ. You can be complete in Christ. Verse 8 tells us, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body, so you also are complete. Someone say complete. You are complete. How? Through your union with Christ through your union with Christ. When you come to Christ, whenever you put down some roots into Jesus, you're complete. You're complete. Let me say it again. You are complete. And for so many of us, we've got this Jewish legalist idea that, well, I've got to perform a certain way for God to love me and accept me. I've got to, I've got to do a certain thing to be accepted by a holy and righteous God. And this is what Paul is saying here. That's a bad idea. Try it if you want to. You're never, you're never going to live up to that, though. How do, you, how do you become complete? There's only one way, through Christ Jesus. You've got to put your roots down into him. You've got to become connected and attached to Jesus. Then you are complete. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down too. This is good. This is good stuff. You are complete in Jesus. This is a fact to be enjoyed, not a status to be achieved. The fact that you are complete in Jesus is a fact that you can enjoy, not a status that you have to achieve. I've heard from so many people over the years. I've had lunch with several different people. They'd say, you know, you still up there with Brother Billy at Calvary Tabernacle? Yes, I I sure am. Oh, man, every one of them said the same thing. He's a wonderful guy. He's a wonderful guy. I say, yes, he sure is. That's a good church. Y'all have got good people up there. Yes, we sure do. And then they'll say something like this. Well, one day I plan to come back. But I just haven't been doing good lately. I haven't been doing the right thing. My wife and I have been having problems. Work has been insanely busy. I've made some mistakes. I've done things I'm not proud of, and I hear it over and over again. One of these days, I get my life back together. I'm going to come back up there to Calvary Tabernacle. And I tell them this, why not Sunday? Come on. (laughs) Because here's the thing, you can do, 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 do. You can try to achieve all you want, but you will never, through your own effort, be complete. You can't complete yourself. Nothing you could do could complete who you are. The only way you become complete is through Christ Jesus. And that is a fact to be enjoyed, not a status to be achieved. Whoo! <laughs> mm. 
You can be complete in Christ. There's need for nothing else, only Jesus. I don't know if you realize this through reading your Bible, but Jesus' half-brother James didn't even believe that Jesus was the Son of God until Jesus was resurrected. Think about this. Jesus is going around, and he's, he's performing miracles that just would boggle your mind, miracles that your imagination couldn't even fully fathom. And his own half-brother James is like, dude, you're a fake. You say you're the son of God? <laughs> I am too. Which, I, I mean, I kind of understand James a little bit. Because if one of my siblings came to me and was like, hey, I'm the son of God, I would probably need a little bit more than a resurrection for, for me to believe that. Like, I'm going to need a little bit of proof. You're the son of God? Okay, you, you, you're going to have to do something better than that. Come on, you're going to have to really prove it because James didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God until Jesus was resurrected. But after the resurrection, James believed and ended up becoming the head of the church in Jerusalem. And all this is in your Bible. This is what James wrote about faith, the idea, the subject of faith. James chapter 1, verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Nothing. I don't need a thing because I'm already complete in Jesus. This is coming from a guy who didn't believe. He grew up with Jesus. I could imagine, you know, Jesus is walking around the house and Mary and Joseph are, oh, Jesus, good job, way to go. You aced that test or, you know, you're such a brilliant kid. James, go clean your room. You acted crazy up in here. <laughs> I can imagine James is like, oh, they just love him so much more than me. Like, this is just all in my imagination. That's not in your Bible. <laughs> That's just in my imagination. <laughs> James doesn't believe in Jesus. His whole childhood, all of his teenage years, all through Jesus' 20s, and even whenever Jesus starts his ministry, James still doesn't believe him. In fact, the Bible tells us in certain parts that James ridicules Jesus during his ministry. But after the resurrection, James believes. And now he's telling, I mean, come on. If we're talking about someone who I want to hear a message about faith from, let it be from the guy who didn't originally believe. The guy that was fully convinced. The guy that became completely confident in. He tells us this, you want to be complete, lacking nothing? You need to have faith in Jesus. You need to have faith in Jesus. Jesus and Jesus alone. You will never be complete without him. And the problem is every human heart is incomplete. We are naturally incomplete. And most of us, talking about most of humanity, we look to all different things, all different ideas, all different relationships to find some sort of fulfillment, something that can complete me. And for most of us, unfortunately, we tend to turn to the easiest route to be completed. Y'all know what the easiest route is? Th that we think we can be completed? Uh, it's me. I think I can complete myself. <laughs> I think I can do enough. I think I can be good enough. I think I can, uh, I, I think I have good enough understanding. I think I've got good enough intuition. I think I've got good enough instincts to be able to survive this and do this on my own. Let me illustrate it to you this way. 
few years ago, Emily and I took a trip to the Grand Canyon. It's one of my bucket list things I wanted to do. And uh, I love to hike, and I love to be out in nature. I love to going backpacking. And, and so we decided uh, we were going to hike down uh, a trail into the canyon because I, I'm not the kind of guy that, like, you know, you pull up to a national park. Any of y'all like national parks? Anybody? All right. I'm the only one. All right. Brother James, thank you. <laughs> You can pull up and they're just um, incredibly beautiful. Just astounding the beauty that God created in nature. And a lot of people, they pull up, they park at the visitor center, they go in the store, buy a couple of souvenirs, they walk out and see just, you know, the, the, the main event, the main attraction. Like, wow, it's really cool. Let's take some pictures, a couple selfies. All right, let's pack up, let's go. It's hot out here. I'm the kind of guy, I'm like, nah, I need, to, I need at least four or five days in each park. Like, I don't like to zip through them. Sometimes I do, but, uh, but I, I need some time to, to get in this thing, to really see. Because on top of the Grand Canyon, if you're standing at the rim looking down, you will be amazed beyond your comprehension of how beautiful and how big this thing really is. Pictures do not do it justice. And you can go away with an understanding, but if you walk down into it, you get a completely different perspective. Because now you're not just looking down, but you're looking down and up. And you're seeing God's handiwork all around you. And so we're hiking down this trail. Would you put that uh, video up there for me, please, Taya? We're hiking down this trail. Hey, watch out. Male and female. that close to it on the trail like i mean what if he smells something what if i'm wearing the wrong color shirt and he just decides i don't like that guy i'm gonna be uh bruised and beat up for a little while And as you get to any national park, there's always information posted on signs and in the visitor center, and, and rangers are walking around telling every pe- everybody, like, don't interact with the wildlife. Don't interact with them. Why? Because if you try to feed them, they're going to start associating humans with a food source. Oh, I can, I can go to them, and, and I, can, I can get food from them. And what happens? Most humans are like, what? Anybody got any food? Oh, I got a candy bar in my bag. Let's see if you'll eat that. Well, candy bars, turns out, aren't, aren't good for animals, just like they're not very good for humans either. Uh, but the more you interact with these wild animals, the less fearful they are or hesitant they are around human beings. So they start showing up in parking lots and campsites and and just hanging out along the roadsides, and, and we see that animals are, are getting killed by being run over by vehicles and, and from something that they ingested that they should not have ingested, or, or, or maybe they become aggressive to humans, and so the rangers have to put the animal down, so it's not a, and it's a, it's a whole big ordeal. It's not a good thing. So they tell you, don't mess with the wildlife. So it's pretty rare for you to have an encounter that close to one of these incredible animals. And as they're coming up, though, I'm like, we can't do anything about it. Like, how am I not going to have a close encounter with this thing? Either it's going to have to jump off or I'm going to have to jump off. And I choose neither. I'll just let them go, go on by. But they say that animals, whenever they go from point A to point B, they tend to take the path of least resistance. 
That's why if you go walking into the woods here in East Texas, you'll see game trails everywhere. These little highways that these animals have, have run into the ground <laughs> because they tend to travel on the path of least resistance. And can I tell you something? That's in our human nature too. I want to go the way that's going to be the easiest for me. And for these incredible desert bighorn sheep, the easiest path for them to get from the river up to the rim apparently was to just to go up all those switchbacks where all the humans are and, and, and just try to skirt past them right on the edge. How many of you can relate to that in your life? You're going through something terrible. You're going through something hard. What's the path of least resistance for me to get out of here? What's the easiest way for me to avoid this situation? And in the process, we end up hurting ourselves because sometimes we think that the path of least resistance is our own wisdom and our own strength, and no one knows me better than I do, right? This is what Paul is saying here. You need to have complete confidence in, and you need to understand that you are only complete one way, and that's through Jesus. And you might think the path of least resistance is your own wisdom, your own knowledge, your own strength. But let me tell you right now, if you will learn to surrender those things and find your identity in Christ, you will become complete through him. Come on, church. Mm. It's all about Christ from start to finish. We are complete only through Christ. In the book of Colossians, Paul mentions Christ 40 times. As we're reading through chapter 2, I asked you every time the word Christ came up on the screen just to shout it out. That's wise because Paul is setting a, an example. He's setting a precedent. He's laying the foundation. There's only one way, and it's through Jesus. We've got to get this in our hearts, y'all. We can be confident in this man, Jesus, and we can understand that we are only made complete through this man, Jesus. Here's my last point. You can be connected to Christ. You can be confident in Christ. You can be complete in Christ. And you can be connected to Christ. What does Paul say? He says, set down some roots. Grab on. Build your life on. This is a firm foundation. Go ahead and start building. Mm. A few weeks back, I was uh, talking with Emily, and I think I shared this, uh, this story with y'all last time I preached, but I was telling her that I wanted to build a treehouse for the boys. And she said that would, be a, that, that would be awesome. It'll just probably never happen. And so I took that personally. I went to Home Depot I bought a lot of things, went back home and started building a tree house. Just almost got it finished, almost got it finished. And the boys are absolutely loving it. But before I went to Home Depot and bought all the supplies, I went online and I started researching how to build a tree house. I'm not a carpenter. That's why I didn't bring a picture to show y'all because some of y'all would be like, oh my goodness. His poor children. We need to pray for Jack and Luke. Mm. But I went on like how to build a tree house. And one of the first steps is you got to pick out your trees, right? Because this is an actual tree house. It's not just a little thing on stilts. Like I'm like, I, I want a legit tree house for my boys. So I'm going to find some trees and I'm going to build a tree house in the trees. And uh, so one of the first things, you got to pick out your trees. And so it had some very good advice, very good wisdom on, on how to pick out trees. Like, you don't just go picking out any tree. It said, the first thing you got to do is find a tree that is at least 16 inches in diameter. So in other words, you can't just be building on a little puny tree. Why? Because it's too much weight. But the biggest reason is because more mature trees have more mature root systems. And the information that it gave me was most species of trees, by the time they reach 16 inches in diameter, have an established root system healthy enough, as long as the tree is healthy, healthy enough to withstand the weight of a treehouse 
and the wind that blows against the treehouse. Because I don't know if you've noticed before, but trees are actually very good at uh, letting wind pass through them. God in his infinite wisdom created them kind of in a cylinder. So the wind just kind of comes and it just goes around it. And the, the trees and branches as, as big and massive as they are here in East Texas, God created them for the wind to be able to blow through the leaves and the branches. He's a very wise God. <laughs> But whenever you put a tree house in it, it's like you just put a sail up on a sailboat. Now all the wind that's blowing is going to catch onto that tree house and it's going to push on those trees. And so as I'm researching this, it's saying you've got to find a tree with some healthy roots. You've got to find a tree that looks good. You've got to find a tree that's big enough and mature enough. Why? So that whenever the wind blows against the house, the roots are firmly established enough to hold on to hold it up. And it said this, it said after about two to three years, after you put the tree house in the tree, after about two to three years, or within the first two to three years, the tree notices the added weight that's been put on it, and it notices the force from the wind that is now pushing against it because you've built that tree house there. And God has created these trees in his infinite wisdom to know how to say, okay, the wind is pushing this way, so I need to send out roots that way so that I can hold on better. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that God could create something like that? And whenever Paul is saying this, he's saying set your roots down into him. What he's saying is this, the winds are going to blow. And there are going to be times where weight is thrust on your shoulders, pushing down. You've got to be rooted into something. You've got to grab on to something. You've got to attach yourself to something. And Paul is saying this, there is nothing better in all of creation to put your roots down into than Jesus Christ. You've got to set your roots down into him. How many of y'all notice that once a tree sets its roots, that tree's not going to go anywhere? <laughs> it's not going to one morning wake up and be like, ah, I like that spot over there better, and pull up its roots. Once those roots are there, that tree doesn't move. That tree stays. This is what I believe Paul is saying through this. You don't need a plan B. When it comes to Christ, you could put your roots down into him, and you're secure. You don't have to pick up and move. You don't have to pick up and trust in anything else. You don't have to go one way or another. When your roots are deep down into Christ, the winds can come, the weight can settle down, but you're firmly established. You will not be moved. Oh, come on. Come on. Paul is saying this, you don't need a plan B, just set some roots down, build your lives on, put your complete confidence in us. And most of us, whenever obstacles come our way, what do we tend to do? I got to get out of here. My coworkers are awful. Find me another job. My spouse is crazy. Go find me another one. <laughs> You're laughing, but how many people have made that decision? And I'm not just saying that that, that decision was made just, ah, pff, just go find me. That's not what I'm, I'm not trying to say. But when obstacles come, we tend to try to move out of the way. When things come against us, we... We try to, to shift. I'm going to leave that church. Did you hear what she said? I'm, I'm leaving that church. That's our first instinct is I'm going to move. I'm going to go. And this is what Paul is saying. Life is going to get crazy. The wind is going to blow. The weight's going to settle down on you. 
cut your roots down into Christ. Hold on to Jesus. Whenever the winds come and the weight bears down on you, you've got something to hold on to. In 2008, the Summer Olympics held in Beijing, Michael Phelps did what everyone thought was impossible. In that one Olympic year, he won eight gold medals. Eight gold medals. No one thought it would ever be achieved. The record was seven, and they said that that will never be matched again. There's no way anyone could win eight. And here comes Michael Phelps, an American swimmer. In 2008, he swam and won eight gold medals and is known today as the most decorated Olympian in history. During those 2008 Summer Olympics, Phelps was racing in the 200-meter butterfly event and he stepped up onto the block in the fourth lane. And he took his position, and when the shot rang out, he dove in. And immediately upon breaking the surface of the water, he noticed something's not quite right. Water started to leak into his goggles. 200 meters is, a pool is 50 meters. You've got to go down, take a lap, come back. Take a lap, go back, and for the last time, come back to the starting point. By the second lap, Phelps' goggles were completely full of water. I don't know if you've ever been swimming before and put on a cheap pair of goggles, but you know that's not a pleasant experience. So what do you do? You, just, you get up. You. Unfortunately, if you're in the Olympics, you don't have that the privilege of, of taking a time out. Hey, y'all, wait, wait a second. I got water in my goggles. Y'all stop. Y'all stop. And in swimming, you either win or lose by milliseconds. So for Michael Phelps, he didn't have the ability to stop for even just one stroke and empty out his goggles and then continue on. His goggles filled up with water, and by the second lap, his vision was completely blurry. And underneath uh, the water in an Olympic pool, there is uh, markers that mark your lanes where you're supposed to swim so you don't veer into the other person's lane. And at the end of the lane, there's a black T that shows that the wall is approaching. And as Phelps is swimming in this event, his vision becomes blurry, his eyes start to burn. And it gets to the point to where he can't see anything. So what do you do in a situation like that? Good thing for Michael Phelps, he had an incredible coach, a man named Bob Bowman. And his coach would oftentimes meet him at the pool, give him some instructions, have Phelps start to practice. And then Bob Bowman would go and turn the lights out in the whole facility and make Michael Phelps practice in the dark for the entire practice that day, which could last for hours. So Michael Phelps did what he knew to do. Whenever his vision got blurry and his eyes were burning and he just couldn't see anymore, he just closed his eyes and kept swimming. By the third turn, as he's on his way back, about halfway, he can hear the crowd start to get riled up a little bit, and everyone's getting excited, and, and he can hear the screams and the cheers of the crowd that's watching this event take place, and Michael Phelps doesn't know, though, if they're cheering for him, if he's in the lead, or if he's way behind and someone else is in the lead. He has no idea. All he knows is that at that third turn, it takes him 21 strokes to get to the end of the pool, to where he can reach his hand out and glide and touch the end of the pool. 21 strokes, and he knew this because he had practiced over and over and over and over and over and over again in the light and in the darkness. He knew 21 strokes 
reach out my hand and glide into the edge of the pool. And so on stroke 18, the crowd is just going wild. Stroke 19, he knows I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Stroke 20, the crowd is just erupting. Stroke 21, his last stroke, he pushes with his hands and then he reaches out for the edge of the pool and he, he grabs on to the edge of the pool and he timed it perfectly with his eyes closed. And when he came up above the water, holding on to the edge of the pool, he took his goggles off, blinked his eyes several times and looked up at the scoreboard and saw that he won the event. He'd be getting a gold medal for the 200 meter butterfly race. But even more incredible, right there on the scoreboard next to his name were green letters, WR, world record. Not only had he completed and won the race, but he had crushed the world record for the Olympic 200 meter butterfly race. And he did it all with his eyes closed. Now let me tell you, if you throw me into an Olympic-sized pool, I might not even make it from one side to the other. I'm definitely not going to be anywhere within range of competition with these guys. Why? Because that's not what I've practiced. That's not what I've done. That's not what I've spent my life on. That's not, what my, that's not where my passions have been. That's not where I have said, hey, this is what I am. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to swim. I'm a swimmer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the best swimmer that there ever was. But for Michael Phelps, that was his reality. He had practiced. He had performed. He had practiced again. He had performed. He had practiced again. And he had done it with the lights on, with the lights off, hoping that no matter what happened in the pool, he would be able to still compete. And so all he did as he's swimming through the water without being able to see what's around him, he was still able to see and go back to all of those moments in practice and in the pool back in America that he swam in. And he knew exactly it takes 21 strokes. I've got to keep this rhythm. I've got to keep this pace. I've got to kick like this. I've got to push like this. He knew exactly what to do. He, he knew one thing, and that's swimming. I think what Paul is telling us is that if you know one thing, let it be Jesus. Because when these things start to try to leak in and cloud your vision and confuse you, and torment your mind and take you back to a dark place and the winds blow against you and the weights bearing down on you, you need to know one thing and that's Jesus. Why? Because when these things happen, you need something that you can hold on to. You need something that you can say, I may not know how to get out of this situation, but I know Jesus. And as long as I hold on to him, I'm going to make it through. I'm going to get to the other side. And I love this about God is that he's so good. That whenever we hold on to him, it's like, man, that's easy. That's a breeze. Another world record, just another day in the life of, of Michael Phelps, you know. <laughs> because we know Jesus. Because we know Jesus. Don't waver. Don't cave in. Don't make any excuses. Just keep to what you know to be true. Stay in rhythm. Paul says, let your roots grow down into Jesus and let your lives be built on him. You can be confident in Christ. You can be complete in Christ. And you can be connected to Christ. If the worship team would come on up. John 15, verse 4. Jesus says these words. Remain in me. Remain in me. And I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, 
you can do nothing. I tend to think of, of Paul being an East Texan right here. He can't do nothing. If you don't remain in Jesus, you can't do nothing. But as long as we hold on to that vine, as long as these branches are connected to this tree, as long as these roots are set down deep into Jesus, as long as you remain in him, here's the promise, you will produce fruit. Jeremiah tells us a story about a tree in the desert. He says those who put their trust in, in human wisdom and human strength are, are like a shrub that shrivels up and dies in the desert sun and the desert wind. But those who put their trust in God are like a tree who's planted by a river and its roots reach deep down into the water. And this tree is not worried about the wind. This tree is not worried about the sun, but this tree produces fruit in every season. That's what Jeremiah tells us. Every season. I believe it's in the book of John. Jesus, he's walking with his disciples from one place to another. And, and the Bible tells us Jesus is hungry. I'm, I'm, hung, I'm ready to eat. And as he's walking past, there's a, a fig tree. Jesus goes up to it and it's got leaves on it, but there's no fruit. And he goes to examine the tree and he's looking through the tree, looking through the leaves. There's no fruit. And so what does Jesus do? He curses it. disciples tell us that that tree died withered up but they also tell us that it wasn't the particular season for figs to be growing <laughs> and I used to read this story and think Jesus that's kind of harsh that's a little much don't you think like it wasn't even fig season and you see a fig tree and you're hungry and because it doesn't have any food, you curse it and it dies. It's not even supposed to be producing. But here's the truth. Are y'all ready for this church? If y'all would stand with us today. Here's the truth. When Jesus is in the room, it's always fig season. When Jesus is there, when Jesus is around, it's always season for fruit it's always season so I love this that, that Jesus he's just got so much faith he just, he just walks up and he's teaching the disciples all about faith and he walks up at this tree doesn't have any figs and he's like curse you this thing dies <laughs> why because when Jesus is in the room there's going to be fruit in the room and if there's not something's wrong <laughs> Something's wrong. As we worship this morning, I want to encourage you to do this. Be confident in Christ. Be complete in Christ. Be connected to Christ. And what does Paul say in verse 7? He says, let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you are taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. How do you know if you're confident in Christ? How do you know if you are complete in Christ? How do you know if you are connected to Christ? Can I give you a couple of indicators that Paul shows us here? He says, if you are, then your faith will grow strong in the Lord or in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So how do I know if I'm connected to Christ? Can I ask you this? Are you thankful? Are you generally a thankful person? Whenever obstacles come up and trials come up, do you consider it an opportunity for great joy? Or are we complaining, oh man, not again. It just seems like every time I get my family in church, something goes wrong and yada, 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 yada. It just seems every time things start going well and everybody's getting healthy, all of a sudden, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or are we saying, God, I'm going to use this as an opportunity for great joy. Why? Because in these moments, my faith is tested. And when my faith is tested, I have an opportunity to grow. And when I grow, there's just going to be this natural fruit production of thankfulness. 
So how do you know if you're connected? How do you know if you're complete? How do you know if you're confident in Christ? Let me give you the little indicator. Are you thankful? And if you feel like you're in a time and a moment in your life where you're like, ah, just, I've been more complaining than I have been thankful. And I found more excuses than I found joy. Can I encourage you? Today is a day where you can put those roots back down into Christ. Today is a day where you can say, listen, I've I've tried to pull up my roots and go to somewhere else, but right now I'm going to put my roots back down into Christ. I'm going to build this house back onto Christ because I know when the winds come and I know when the weight bears down on me, I will not be moved. Come on, Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you have made yourself available to us so that we can be confident in you. That you have made your ways known to us so that we can be confident in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you that that not only can we have complete confidence in God, but I thank you, Lord, that we can be complete in you. That we can be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we can be connected to you that you're not distant, that you've not removed yourself from us, that you've not hidden your face or your love from us, God, but that you have come to reveal your heart to us. And I pray, Lord, that as we look into your word, as we set down some roots, as we start to build our lives more and more on you, God, I pray that every op- every obstacle that comes up would just become an opportunity for joy. That every trial that comes up would just be another reminder to bear fruit in season and out of season. Another reminder to to build our lives and to trust in you. God, we thank you for who you are, that you are good, that your love is always good, that your love never fails. And Lord, I pray that you would just move on the hearts of all of your people this morning as we worship you, God. That you would speak to your people and that we would respond in Jesus' name. Jesus' name.